Good evening, everyone. I am Ella Lacey, and I come to you tonight as president of the Carbondale branch of the American Association of University Women, or in simpler terms, AAUW. We realize that in this holiday season, there are other tasks and many other Zoom platforms in which you might have engaged tonight, but you have chosen to spend an hour with us and we hope to offer you a program that is stimulating, refreshing, informative, all worth your while. Our program tonight will have three parts. One, we want to share with you the pride we derive from having a student member of our branch gain a significant statewide honor. And we will have another member of our branch, Dr. Marsha Anderson, a retired SIU professor, present Miriam McDoom to you and explain the honor of such a recognition. Two, after Miriam's recognition, I will introduce our featured speaker for the evening, Dr. Glenn Pichard. He will bring to us a presentation on leadership from within. And the third part, following Dr. Pichard's presentation, Dr. Linda Flowers, a retired teacher and principal from the Carbondale Elementary School District will sort and synthesize questions that you have submitted by way of the Q&A at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Just try to make sure your question is stated clearly and that it is related to Dr. Pichard's presentation. If you have a question, please enter it into the Q&A so that Dr. Flowers can present it as time permits us to. Now I present AAUW member, Marsha Anderson. Thank you, Ella. Our theme for this evening's program is leadership and we felt it was appropriate to recognize our AAUW student member for her recent leadership award. It is a delight to recognize Maryam Maktoum as the 2020 Lincoln Academy of Illinois Student Laureate for Southern Illinois University Carbondale. Each fall, an outstanding senior from each of the four-year degree-granting institutions of higher learning in Illinois is awarded by the governor the Abraham Lincoln Civic Engagement Award. These award recipients then become student laureates of the Lincoln Academy of Illinois. In the spirit of Lincoln, student laureates are honored for their leadership and service in the pursuit of the betterment of humanity and for overall excellence in curricular and extracurricular activities. Miriam wants to devote her life to helping improve the health and lives of people. She is particularly interested in the emerging interdisciplinary field of global health diplomacy. Her goal is to become a physician and she will likely specialize in the care of women and children. Miriam's academic achievements and abilities led to her selection as a university honors student and she will chair SIU's Honors Research Symposium in spring 2021. Plans for a career spent helping others came as no surprise to those who have seen Miriam devote much time and energy to helping others as a solution. Community service has already played a large role in her college career. Miriam and a colleague will present the February AAUW program entitled Emerging Youth for Humanity. They will speak about the importance of volunteerism with a focus on outreach and interaction with people from different backgrounds. 
I am honored to introduce Maryam Makdoum to share a few words tonight. Maryam? Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. I would like to thank AUW for the recognition I'm receiving tonight. It's a great honor to be recognized by such amazing role models in the community, and it really inspires me to push myself further, to keep on developing myself, and to keep on contributing to my own community as well. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam, and uh, thank you, Marcia, for the introduction. That was very, very nice. We look forward to what is ahead and sharing as much of that as possible with you, Miriam. And now it is my pleasure and my honor to introduce our speaker for the evening. Dr. Glenn Pichard is a true exemplar of life and leadership in Illinois. Glenn graduated from Carmi White County High School and is a three degree graduate of SIU, all in the field of education. He has taught classes and coached sports at the high school level and he has directed a community-based university program in Benton, Illinois. He served in the Illinois Senate and the U.S. Congress before giving a close and full competition to a run to become governor of the state of Illinois. In his final higher education experience, Dr. Pichard served as Vice Chancellor of SIUC, then as Chair of the SIU Board of Trustees, and later as President of the SIU System. After retirement, Glenn joined his wife, Jo, and founded the Pichard Foundation for Abused Children. For several years, their foundation efforts have enabled them to raise and distribute $100,000 annually to Southern Illinois charities that serve children who are high risk for abuse. In addition, they also led an effort that has resulted in a women's shelter being built and residentially occupied in Cairo, Illinois. Even more recently, in a contentious environment, Glenn and Joe Pichard embarked on a system of marches and courthouse presentations to give flavor to a quest for unity, noting, and I quote, Voices of disrespect and violence completely cover even the smallest voice for respect and unity among our people. End of quote. So now I am pleased to present to you Dr. Glenn Pichard, a champion for leadership from within. Thank you, Ella. Uh, wow. uh, can you folks hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. I wasn't sure if I was unmuted. Thank you so much, Ella, for the kind introduction and thank you and Marcia and all the members of the AUW uh, for this invitation. I really appreciate it. Um, I want to start out by telling you that I have been a disciple of Parker Palmer for, uh, I don't know how many years, 35, maybe 40 years. Uh, as you can read on your screen, uh, he is a senior associate of the American Association of Higher Education. And in 1998, the Leadership Project, a national survey of 10,000 administrators and faculty named Palmer as one of the 30 
most influential senior leaders in higher education and one of the 10 key agenda setters of the past decade. Uh, he has lectured many times in Washington at the Servant Leadership Institute there. And uh, uh, I became aware of him uh, many, many years ago and have tried to pattern my style of leadership after him. So I want to begin uh, by giving you his definition of a leader. Um, he said that a person who has an unusual degree of power to project on other people his or her shadow or his or her light. And this power creates the conditions under which other people must live and move and have their being. Conditions which can be illuminating and uplifting to the people or conditions which can cast them into total darkness. That's how much power that leadership has. And I'm gonna go into uh, two kinds of leadership uh, here tonight and, and uh, sort of illustrate my experiences with those types of leadership as we go through. If we could have the next uh, slide. I had the great honor in 1990 of one of my heroes addressing a joint session of Congress. Vaclav Havel had uh, suffered under communist uh, domination in Czechoslovakia, was thrown in jail there for, for a, a, a couple of decades. Uh, he was a poet and he sent his poetry out to the people underground and inspired them to keep fighting against the communists. And when uh, the, the communism fell in his country, they elected him president of Czechoslovakia. He, has, uh, he had a, an experience much like Nelson Mandela in South Africa. So he said to us in his speech before Congress, America is approaching democracy uninterruptedly for more than 200 years, and your journey has never been disrupted by a totalitarian system. The communist type of totalitarian system has brought us horrors that fortunately you have not known, but it has given us something positive, a special capacity to look from time to time somewhat further than someone who has not undergone this bitter experience. A person who cannot move and lead a somewhat normal life because he is pinned under a boulder has more time to think about his hopes than someone who is not trapped that way. We must all learn many things from America, from how to educate our children, how to elect our representatives, all the way to how to organize our economic life so that it will lead to prosperity and not to poverty. But it doesn't have to be merely assistance from the well-educated, the powerful, and the wealthy to someone who has nothing and therefore has nothing to offer in return. And this is the part I want to dwell on for the rest of my lecture here tonight. He said to us in a joint session of Congress, we too can offer something to you, our experience and the knowledge that has come from it. The specific experience I'm talking about has given me one certainty, that consciousness precedes being and not the other way around as the Marxists claim. For this reason, and this is so important, and I'm gonna come back to this at the end of the lecture. For this reason, the salvation of this human world lies nowhere else than in the human heart, in the human power to reflect, in human meekness and in human responsibility. Without a global revolution in the sphere of human consciousness, nothing will change for the better in the sphere of our being as humans and the catastrophe toward which this world is headed, be it ecological, social, demographic, or a general breakdown of civilization will be unavoidable. So he said to us, unless there is a change in the human heart, these things will all be unavoidable. And that human heart is within the leaders of our nations, our communities, our states, our organizations. Next slide, please. So let's look at leadership. Leadership from without. 
says that this is how we define in this lecture as being. It's the way we are without ever having taken the inward journey toward conscience. This leadership emphasizes skills to manipulate the external world. These people may be very good at public relations. They may have great organizational skills. They may have great financial skills, but, but they're good at manipulating the external world with these skills. And in this leader, matter is more powerful than consciousness. Economics is more fundamental than spirit. The flow of cash creates more reality than the flow of visions and ideas. Here the emphasis is on politics, economics, and the material. These are the leaders who have never gone down into that shadow side of their existence and ever taken stock of who they really are as people. So they just have learned to manipulate the external world that they seek to lead, as opposed to leadership from within. Leadership from within emphasizes consciousness. That is the inward journey to confront those areas of shadow that are within us. It emphasizes skills to make the inward journey toward internal awareness. And here, that journey inside emphasizes consciousness, awareness, thoughtfulness, reflection, and authenticity as the first order of leadership. Now, if you never take this journey inside to ever become aware and trained in leadership from within, you will remain in this leadership from without just trying to manipulate everything around you. And you may have the skills to do that, but it's not the kind of leadership that can move a nation or a state or a people. Next slide, please. So Havel said, after 60 years of being under communist domination, here's the one thing that we can tell you from being under this rock that was upon us, that consciousness must precede being. Only by taking the inward journey, the downward journey, we travel down through the fear and the terror of our shadow side until we reach that deep place where we can be in community with each other. And I'm gonna talk about that now because I wanna help you understand the difference between consciousness or leadership from within and leadership from without or being as, as we refer to it here. So uh, ne next, uh, next uh, uh, slide, please. When we take the inner journey, particularly with respect to leadership, what are the areas of shadow which we must confront? Next slide, please. So being, that is leadership that's never gone down inside themselves and figured out who they are. Being says people rise to leadership by a tendency toward extroversion. They're great extroverts but they ignore what's going on inside themselves. They can operate very effectively and very efficiently on the external world. They may be great orators, but they're good at using fear. They're good at using persuasion skills to get people to do what they want them to do. They develop the skills to manipulate the external world around them because that's easier than dealing with the inner world inside them. So leadership from without or being emphasis here is on what I do. It's what I do that's most important. It's my job that defines me. It's my title that defines me. It's my, it's my uh, uh, ability to, to uh, get people to do what I want them to do that defines me. Whereas consciousness says, take the inner journey, develop a philosophy of life, have a clear understanding of the principles in which I believe. 
what do I believe about power? Do I believe that power exists for my own benefit, for my own self good? Or does power benefit, is it there for the greater good of the greater community? What do I believe about compromise? What are the values that I hold that I know I can't compromise on? On the other hand, what can I compromise on? If I'm sitting in the transportation committee and we're trying to decide where a new interstate highway needs to go, I can very easily compromise on whether it goes through Western Kentucky or Southern Illinois or maybe Southeast Missouri. But there are some things that I can't compromise on, that I just can't bring myself to support because they involve my truths, my values, the things that, I, that, that, that are important to me as a person. What do you believe about criticism? Well, if you seek to lead and you can't take criticism, you can't lead because you're going to get criticism. And, and, and Teddy Roosevelt once said in his speech to the Sorbonne in Paris in 1900, he said, you know, um, it's not the critic that counts. It's the person in the arena whose face is bloodied and marred with dirt and grime and they're knocked down time and time again, but they rise to fight the next battle for justice. Uh, you, you know, so that their place will never be among those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. What do you believe about risk? Are you willing to take a risk in your life to do something to better mankind? Or are you afraid of failure? What about time demands? How, how do you balance family demands with job demands and those sort of things. What do you be, believe about love and forgiveness and these kinds of values? The emphasis here is on who I am as a person, not on what I do. What defines me is who I am and these values and, and this philosophy of life that I go down deep inside and, and try to struggle with and develop. Okay, the next slide, please. Being says, competition. Life is a battleground. Whatever it takes to win, that's, what, that's the only thing that matters. Life is about wins and losses. Wins and losses. The only thing that really counts is winning. And so, the, the person who's never gone inside, this is the way they see their life. I've got to win. And here, words and actions do not have to be congruent because the end product is all that matters. The communists say the end justifies the means. Okay? Because words and actions don't have to follow. There's no consideration of morality here. Whereas consciousness, leadership by consciousness, says that cooperation and contribution to the greater good is really what matters. Words and actions should be congruent because the process, the journey is equally important. My dad, my dad only had one arm. And so as a young person, he experienced a lot of uh, discrimination. He and mom were married during the depression. They had five kids. Daddy got a job as a water bucket carrier on a road crew working on WPA in road crews that were building roads to the Shawnee Forest. They built a nursing home in Carmi and they came out into the hill country where I grew up and picked up my mother and other ladies in a van, took them into Carmi and they scrubbed floors on their hands and knees to make a living. 60 cents an hour, both of them made on WPA. That's how they raised the family. But my dad, he, he, he was a Roosevelt person, but he loved Harry Truman because he had experienced discrimination. And Harry Truman integrated the armed forces. He was the first president to do that. So in August of 1960, 
our little uh, backwood country church it was all friends, coal miners, small farmers, good people, solid people. We had this itinerant preacher come through the countryside, and we had a habit of always inviting these folks to, to grace our pulpit. And this guy gets up, and he starts preaching. And he says, if John Fitzgerald Kennedy becomes president of the United States, the Pope will rule America. And everybody in our little church is just sitting there, pins and needles, because we'd never heard that kind of prejudice preached before. And at the end of that sermon, at the end of that church, I watched my dad go up to this guy on the porch of that church. He put his one hand up on his shoulder, and he said to the gentleman, sir, you are never welcome in our church again, because we don't hear that kind of prejudice preached from our pulpit. Because you see, my dad had said at the supper table, race doesn't matter, religion doesn't matter, ethnicity doesn't matter. You know, now I saw my dad, his words to us kids and his actions toward that preacher were one and the same. And he gave us all a gift that day. So the person that, that, that consciousness applies to, you know, their words and their actions are one and the same. And my father understood that as well as anybody. Next slide, please. Being, that is, uh, 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 it says that everything rests with me. I have the ultimate responsibility for the total outcome of whatever we're doing, a project, a program, the state, the nation, here, there's a, a tendency toward workaholic behavior, burnout, stress, strained and broken relationships, very unhealthy priorities. But the emphasis is always upon me and my program, not about us. And I am as guilty of this workaholic behavior as anyone I've ever known. It took me years to unlearn that behavior because I grew up understanding that work is what you do, work is what you do, you know? And, and I had this idea that I could not miss a vote. I, I couldn't miss a vote in the state Senate. I couldn't miss a vote in Congress. I would kill myself to get back to Washington. So I'd be there in time to cast a vote at 11 o'clock in the morning. I messed up so many times trying to do the will of the people. My daughter was homecoming queen over at Carterville at the high school. And I've got it on tape, but I wasn't there. And I should have been there. But this kind of tendency toward workaholic behavior, it just is terrible on families. But many of us grow up this way and we have it. And those are unhealthy behaviors. Consciousness, however, consciousness preceding being. Consciousness says there are many acts in town and some are better than mine. I don't have to carry the whole load. I can share the load. I can even lay the load down at times. This is more healthy priorities. The emphasis here is on the team, not on me. I can lay the load down. I don't have to destroy the people around me because the emphasis has always got to be upon me. Next slide, please. Being. Being says, this is, this is the, the leader that has never gone down inside themselves and tried to figure out who they are and overcome the shadow side. These leaders are fearful of negative evaluations. They're fearful of public failure. They're fearful of criticism. The natural chaos of life just sends them into a tizzy. And life is chaotic. We all know that life is chaotic. Nietzsche said that you must have chaos in order to, in order to give birth to a dancing star. So the whole universe is chaos. It's normal, it's natural. We don't, we don't have to look at our lives in fear of the chaos that comes to us in what we're trying to do. 
public failure. You have some leaders that can't abide by failing at anything. They've always got to tell themselves, I can't lose, I can't fail, I can't have a negative evaluation. They're intolerant of differences. They make enemies of people because they're incapable or refuse to go down into that shadow side of themselves and deal with the enemies that are there, then they project that onto others, onto another race, onto another religion, another ethnicity, another sexual orientation, or even an economic system that they don't agree with. But they are intolerant of any differences and their tendency is to make enemies of people that are not like them. They spend a great deal of time trying to eliminate chaos through the development of rigid rules and procedures and manuals. Life is all black and white to them. And what's the emphasis here in this leader? Judgment. It's always judgment. Whereas the leader who has who has tried to develop consciousness, they're willing to risk failure, to have the courage to be imperfect. When I got to Washington, DC, I saw the incredible influence of money on everything out there. The lobbyists passing out money, the PAC organizations passing out money. I didn't think it was good for what I believed in as a democracy. So I made the decision my first year in Washington, I'm not gonna take any more PAC monies because I saw the influence it had in gaining access to people in influencing votes of people. And so I took the risk of, 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 of failing to win again because I didn't have the money that everybody else was gonna have by taking the money. And later, when I ran for governor in 1998, I, I, I refused to take the money. And, and there are many people today who say, you should have taken it. You know, if you'd taken the money, you probably would have won. But you know what? I just couldn't do it. I had to risk that failure because I believe that democracy uh, should not be bought. And so I, had, I made that decision and I couldn't change it. Have the courage to be imperfect. These folks the, on the being side, they, they, they never have the courage to be imperfect. They've always got to be perfect. I, I, I ran the Center for Educators of Gifted Children over the Southern 36 counties of Illinois in my pre career before politics. I was training teachers to recognize creative uh, children, uh, intellectually gifted, uh, uh, ac academically gifted children. We had this one young man, I'll never forget him. He was the medalist on his golf team four years in a row and they won the state championship every year, every year. Tremendous young golfer, straight A average. Never made a B in his whole experience. Wanted to go to Harvard. Well, you don't just go knock on the door and get into Harvard. <clears throat> so when he went before <clears throat> the alumni committee to recommend him, he stood there and every question they asked him, he answered perfectly. I mean, perfectly. But they turned him down. Didn't even consider him. And you know why? because every time he answered their question, he looked at his feet and shuffled his feet. He couldn't look the committee in the eye. And the reason he couldn't was because every time this kid came home with a 71 and medalist for the day on his golf team, dad would remind him that he missed an eight foot putt on number 14 and he should have had a 70. Every time he came home with a trig exam, you know, in the 98, dad would want to know why he didn't get 100. He was never allowed to be imperfect. His dad wouldn't let him. And so he grew up without that ability to endure criticism or public failure or negative evaluations. He had to be perfect. 
Don't do this to our children. Consciousness says we are to be tolerant of differences, appreciate diversity, be able to handle ambiguity, the shades of gray. Life isn't just black and white. Here the emphasis is not upon judgment, it's upon mercy and compassion. I think of President Lincoln's second inaugural address, his greatest address. The war was for all intents and purposes over. He had, the, the, the North had beaten the South decisively at Gettysburg. Grant was chasing Lee down toward Appomattox. Thousands of people gathered in Washington, D.C. to hear the second inaugural address of their president. And what they came with was vindictiveness. The hundreds of thousands of young men had been killed by the South, and they wanted to hear their president say, man, we got them now. Let's just put our, 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 our heel on their throat and stomp them right into the ground. But what did they hear their president say? With malice toward none, with charity for all, let us go forth to heal up the nation's wounds to care for him who has borne the battle, for his widow and his orphan, and to do all that we can to assure a just and lasting peace for ourselves and all nations. They didn't hear vindictiveness. They didn't hear judgment. They heard a president that knew who he was, that had gone down through the terror side and dealt with those issues and came out with mercy and compassion. Next slide, please. Bean says, let's maintain the status quo. Don't rock the boat. Ignore the eternal perspective. Morality doesn't count here. Protect our turf. It's not our problem, it's their problem. Let them solve it. Whereas consciousness says, we welcome change. Change is good, it can be productive if it's done the right way. It has the moral backing of the eternal perspective, consciousness. And this is never more true. If you haven't read Dr. King's letter from Birmingham jail, read it. It's one of the most important readings you'll ever have in your life. He said in that letter, he said, I know the laws of the state of Alabama say that I have to ride in the rear of public conveyance that I can't eat in the restaurant of my choice, that I can't send my children to the best public schools available. But there is a higher law, a eternal law that says I can do all of those things just by virtue of the fact that I am God's created being. You see, he had the moral backing of the eternal perspective behind him in the civil rights movement. And that's why he could lead that movement. Whereas people who never go inside themselves, they ignore that eternal perspective. It doesn't mean anything to them. This leader is willing to sacrifice for the next generation, not just the next campaign. Next slide, please. Being ignores the past. It learns little from our mistakes. I hear people all the time say, let's take America back. And I'm not trying to be political, but I know what they mean. They mean, let's go back to the 50s when everyone had a little white house and a picket fence and a job and everything was great. But everything wasn't great. Not for all of the people. Millions of the people in this country didn't have any of that. And so a person who operates without ever going into consciousness and examining the consciousness, they, they ignore the past realities of those times and the, and the people that didn't have those kinds of things. So they don't learn anything from those kinds of mistakes that the country makes or the state makes or we make as a community. Consciousness says, let's understand the past. Let's truly don't make those kind of mistakes again. We see mistakes as opportunities to seek forgiveness and undertake a more positive approach. 
you know, one of my favorite stories growing up, I have to share this with you, uh, was the prodigal son. You know, this was a young Jewish man who demanded his inheritance before he ever got out of his teens. His wise father didn't want to give it to him, but does. And he goes off into a foreign country and he blows his whole inheritance. And he eventually comes to himself and says, you know, I'm just going to go back home and ask my father if he'll instate me as a servant in his household. I'm not even going to ask for sonship. I'm not even going to ask that. And in my mind's eye, I see his father sitting out on the porch. It's a hot summer day. And he sees this little speck coming down the road toward the house. And in due course, he recognizes it as his prodigal son, his long lost son. You remember what that father did? He didn't sit on that porch with his feet up on the railing and wait for that kid to come and beg forgiveness at his feet. The father got up. He ran off of that porch. He ran down that road. He gathered up this son in his arms and he said, my son that was lost is found. Let's kill the fatted calf and make merry. Let's have a celebration. Here's the thing. If somebody offends us, it is our responsibility to go to that person first. Don't wait for them to come to us and apologize. We go to them. I couldn't tell you how many years ago I learned that lesson and how many times I've had to utilize it to go with the people, to the people with whom I've worked and say, you know, Charlie, I noticed this morning when we were having a conversation that you were kind of upset with me. You know, I don't know what I've done, but I want you to know I'm sorry. I want to I want to get this behind us. So help me out here. You know, that's the way things get cleared up. That's the way we handle forgiveness. Because if we're waiting for that person to come and apologize to us for offending us, may never come. And we'll sit there and it'll get into a grudge and then it'll get into hatred. And then we'll have bigger relationship problems. We are, have the responsibility, those of us that have been offended to take the first step. Next slide, please. So here are the questions I want you to consider. Is who you are more important than what you do? Are cooperation and contribution as important to you as competition? Are your words and actions about your deepest beliefs congruent? Next slide, please. Are you willing to share the burden rather than acting as if everything depended upon you? Do you have the courage to risk failure rather than spending all your time trying to protect a title or a position or an authority? Does your decision-making have eternal backing? Next slide, please. Do you seek others' preservation or self-preservation? Do you value the history, respect the principles of tolerance, or is your way the only way? Next slide, please. As a leader, the way you answer these questions will determine if you project a spirit of light or a spirit of shadow upon the external world and the people that you seek to influence. Being, that is operating upon the external world without ever having made that journey toward consciousness unfortunately, is the modus operandi of most leadership in the world. Next slide, please. Consciousness before being is the mark of great leadership. Lincoln, King, Gandhi, Mother Teresa, Vaclav Havel, Sadat, these were all people that that were under oppression, 
But the suffering gave them a reason to examine and the time to examine consciousness, to understand that consciousness before being is the only way to real community. The only way. If you, if you have ever read Jim Collins' great book on, 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 on good to great, where he interviews these people who have risen to the heads of great corporations, they've taken good companies to make them great companies. He interviewed all of these leaders and he interviewed the employees of these companies. And he found that they all had great skill sets, but there was one thing among all of those leaders, which they all had that was in common to each leader. And you know what that one thing was? It was humility, humility. Because only in humility can you have integrity in leadership. Can you have authenticity in leadership? Next slide, slide please. So here is the downward journey to consciousness that defines if we ever become authentic leaders. Here are the monsters of the deep that we have to deal with. Institutional identity. Does what I do define me? Is that the way I feel good about myself? I've got to have a title, a position, an authority. What about life is about wins and losses? I can't tolerate to lose. I can't lose at anything. I have to win about everything or I'm not worthy. What are you gonna do with that? I'm the center of the universe. If anybody else gets any credit, if anybody else around me uh, 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 is, 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 is uh, capable, if they're, if they're the ones that have cre you know, done the task and achieved the goal, you know, I can't be the center, so I've gotta take credit for everything. I've got to be the center of everything. Fear of failure. How come I can't handle failure? What was it in my life growing up or in my relationships or whatever it was that convinced me that I cannot fail? I have to be perfect at everything. Can I examine that on my way to consciousness? and get it out there? Why do I fear change? Am I afraid that people that didn't have it before in my society might get some more of it now? Whether it's my economic good or my social status or whatever. I don't want change to come about because, you know, I'm the leader, I'm at the top. What about judgment? Why do I have to see other people who are different from me as the enemy? Just because they're not like me. Am I spending all my time just preserving myself? I'm not using my money, my position, my intellect, I'm not using those things to help preserve others in my community? Am I only good for protecting myself and preserving myself? Can I not learn from past mistakes as a nation, as a community, as a people? Do I have to just ignore everything that's going on around me and say, Oh no, I wanna go back to a time that was good for me. But I don't wanna learn about the mistakes that we made to other folks during that time. 
This is the downward journey toward consciousness that the authentic leader must take if they're going to lead their people. And uh, uh, Jennifer, if you can move that up just a little bit, the consciousness at the bottom, if you can. Uh, at the bottom, that says consciousness, sense of community, sense of community. Here is the only place where we develop real community. When we take that downward journey, when we confront these monsters in our shadow side, and we learn to deal with them and overcome them, and, and, and then we can lead toward community, to a sense of community. This is what Havel means by consciousness must come before being. Until you've taken this journey, you can have the best economic system in the world. You can have the best political system in the world, but your leadership will be inauthentic. If you want people to join you, you have to take the journey. Next slide, please. So I wanna go back to Havel's speech and then Jennifer, after this part, I want you to go all the way back to that first part of Havel's speech, because I want to reemphasize something one more time. Havel said, we are still a long way from that family of man. In fact, we seem to be receding from the ideal rather than growing closer to it. Interests of all kinds, personal, selfish, state, nation, group, and if you like company interests, still considerably outweigh genuinely common and global interests. We are still under the sway of the destructive and vain belief that man is the pinnacle of creation and not just part of it, and that therefore everything is permitted. There are still many who say they are concerned not for themselves, but for the cause, while they are demonstrably out for themselves and not for the cause at all. We are still destroying the planet that was entrusted to us and its environment. We still close our eyes to the growing social, ethnic, and cultural conflicts in the world. From time to time, we say that the anonymous mega machinery we have created for ourselves no longer serves, but rather has enslaved us, yet we still fail to do anything about it. In other words, we still don't know how to put morality ahead of politics, science, and economics. We are still incapable of understanding that the only genuine backbone of all our actions, if they are to be moral, is responsibility. Responsibility to something higher than my family, my country, my company, my success. Responsibility to the order of being where all our actions are indelibly recorded and where and only where they will be properly judged. The interpreter or mediator between us and this higher authority is what is traditionally referred to as human conscience. That's the mediator. Now, would you go back, Jennifer? Hold on, I got one more slide. Jennifer? Sorry, let me go back and then I will um, reshare it. Just a second. Okay, Jennifer, I want you to go back to that first slide on Havel's speech just real quickly, and then I'll, then I'll put our last slide up there. We'll just be one more minute, if you folks will bear with me. If you can just go back to that, that first slide on there, right there. I want to I want to emphasize this again. Consciousness precedes being and not the other way around. For this reason, the salvation of this human world lies nowhere else than in the human heart in the human power to reflect, in human meekness, and in human responsibility. Without a global revolution in the sphere of human consciousness, nothing will change for the better in the sphere of our being as humans and the catastrophe toward which this world is headed, be it ecological, social, demographic, or a general breakdown of civilization will be unavoidable unless we have leaders that have taken that journey to consciousness and are capable of building community among us, then 
these things will not be able to be avoided. Now, can you go all the way to the very last slide? One, okay. So here is my favorite definition of leadership and I will end. This comes from Lao Tse, the person who founded the Taoist movement 2,600 years ago in China. He said, the least effective leader is that leader who is feared by the people. A more effective leader is that leader who is loved by the people. But the most effective leader of all is that leader who, when the job is finished and the prize is won, the people will say, we did it ourselves. And that is authentic leadership with integrity that cannot be achieved unless we take the journey toward consciousness. I'm sorry I took so long, forgive me, but I just needed to share that with you. So I'm happy to take any questions. I know I've run over my time, and, but I can be here as long as you all need me to be. Lynn, <laughs> thank you so very much. You know, <laughs> that was a very beautiful and dynamic presentation on a very relevant topic about leadership from within. Yeah. So now, as you ask about our audience and questions for some interaction, um, I hope that we have some questions in the Q&A or in the chat box. You may have had to enter them in the chat box. But Dr. Flowers is going to coordinate that for us uh, by going in and making sure and reading them since our audience can't really talk to you directly. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> they, <are. laughs> they could hear you and okay. see you, but they just can't respond from where they are. Okay. So is Dr. Flowers? Yes. Yes. Okay, okay. Dr. Prashard. Hi, Dr. Here's Flowers. a question. <laughs> okay. In leadership, why does a leader frequently confuse constructive and destructive criticism? Well, because if a leader hasn't really taken the journey inside to know who they are and, and they, they haven't figured that out, they will see almost any criticism as destructive. But you, you, you look at leaders and you know leaders from both sides. You look at leaders that have taken that journey, that know who they are, that aren't threatened by criticism. And those leaders will respond in the right way. They will not see your criticism as destructive at all. They will see it as a way toward change, as something that will make them better, as something that will make the community better. They don't hold grudges against people just because they may have a different viewpoint than what than, than what they have. Mm -hmm. And then apparently, Dr. Prashard, you were so thorough. The only other question <laughs> is, will this PowerPoint be available to the participants? Well, that's up to you all. I don't, uh, uh, as I said, a large part of this is the work of Parker Palmer. Okay, and I, I tried to integrate my own experience into that. So just, just as long as you understand that, this is not copyrighted in any way. So if the AAUW wants to make it available to their folks or whomever, it's there. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Dr. Lacey, do we have time for more questions? We have two more that were submitted. Go ahead, go ahead on those. Uh, for the audience benefit, we have been uh, given the opportunity to expand for 10, 15 minutes if we have to, if we need to. So we'll, we'll respect that. But if you must leave, we understand. But if you can stay, we appreciate it. Okay. Okay, okay Dr. Prashard, how can we instill this in the curriculum of our business schools, i.e. consciousness precedes being? Well, I, I think it's a matter of, uh, you know, the, the, the business school can easily do this if they want to make it a part of the curriculum. 
because there's great people like Parker Palmer that has written multiple books on this, that have given lectures all over the world. Uh, as I said, uh, he was often a lecturer at the um, uh, Institute, the Servant Leadership Institute in Washington, D.C. He lives in Madison, Wisconsin. He's 81 years old now. And uh, he still uh, lectures all over the country. So there is plenty of material for developing a whole course on this in the business school. And, and you know, uh, this, this should be, this I think should be taught to every business leader. Um, because sometimes the business community thinks that they really got to be hard nosed and tough and so on. But, uh, and in some respects you do. Uh, but but a lot of competition is preached in business school. And, you know, competition is great if you want to compete and you compete in a just way, you know. But if you don't, I've coached enough little league teams to know that kids are out there on the field because dad wants them to be and they don't want to be out there. And, and you know, uh, and, and that's not good. That kind of competition is not good. Next question. President Havel said that man was part of creation, but not the pinnacle of it. But That's according right. to Christian Holy Scripture, is man not both part and pinnacle of creation? Well, I think it's how we define pinnacle. I think what, what the Bach of Havel was referring to there was that, that the man who thinks he's pinnacle, that has in mind that I'm the center of the universe, you know, mm -hmm. that if I'm, if I'm uh, the top of the organization or whatever, then I am at the pinnacle. And, and so it all matter, it all counts for me. But what Hobble was saying is authentic leadership says what Lao Tse said there, the good leader will always end up with the people saying, we did it ourselves. And so we don't worry about being at the pinnacle. Our job is to help other people see how we work as a team, how we help each other, how we're other centered, not self centered, you know. And so I think that's what he was trying to say there that, that, you know, it's too much of the time leadership thinks of itself as being the pinnacle of creation. And it's really not. I mean, those of us that care about our spiritual life know that man is not the pinnacle that, 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 that God is. But, you know, that's a different subject. Next question, Dr. Bouchard. Would you consider this presentation suitable for a group of law enforcement leaders? Oh, I think it's suitable for anyone. Because this presentation, uh, Parker Palmer's work, really, it, it's, it's about who we are as a people inside. You know, it's, it's about basic human integrity. And, and, and you know, uh, ju just like uh, that I was mentioning that book, Good to Great, that the, the, the great leaders, the thing that they shared was humility. You know, well, that's a basic human trait that we all need to learn, that we all need to be brought up with. But unfortunately, many of us are not. But yes, I think it could be taught to law enforcement. I think it could be taught to anyone. At least a, a, an hour-long presentation like this, where at least folks can understand the difference between the two leadership styles. Mm -hmm. And then Dr. Lacey, that concludes our questions. We do have remarks about this being a great meeting and a wish that uh, many of our political leaders could uh, hear this conversation that they think that they could learn a lot from it. <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Flowers. And as we thank the audience for those great questions. Um, so, in closing, I want to first thank Dr. Fashard for the passion and knowledge that he displayed in this presentation. Um, I had Joe here watching over my shoulder, Ella. Okay. 
Okay, that's great. I truly believe that there are those among us who will be able to wholeheartedly take heed of what they learned. We know for it without a doubt that all of us are better off for having heard your words of wisdom. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you, Dr. Pashari. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I enjoyed okay. being here. Okay. All right. Uh, we also want to thank Miriam McDoom. We thank you for the work you have already done and for considering a path on which to achieve your work. We also thank you for letting us shine a moment of spotlight on you and your work. We will always wish you the best. Thanks also to Dr. Anderson and Dr. Flowers for facilitating your respective parts of tonight's program. And again, we are indebted to Carbondale Public Library for all of their technical and supportive assistance, which they so willingly give. We recognize that our library is a real treasure in this community. Institutional leadership happens from within our library, without a doubt. Yes. And the best part is our audience. Some are current members of AAUW, some are future members, but everybody here is a supporter. And for that, we give you appreciation very dearly. Thank you for all that you do for the development of girls and women in the world. Now for a word about our future programming with AAUW or programming in the community. In the immediate future, I hope that everyone will, will remember that in addition to Thursday being Human Rights Day, International Human Rights Day, it is also Jane Addams Day, which is a day of recognition brought about by Southern Illinois school children. A day for honoring the work of Jane Addams in settlement houses in Chicago. And when you go to Google Jane Addams, remember it's the Addams with two Ds. Our January program on public policy will be AAUW centered. Yet, we welcome you to join us by uh, following us on Facebook until we give a date for a public program, but we also invite you to our personal program and we'll let you know that on Facebook. To everyone, thank you so much and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.